the next speaker will be uh, Mr. Jamal Kazmi. Mr. Jamal Kazmi graduated with a BSc degree in physics from the University of Azad, Jammu and Kashmir, Pakistan in 2013. He continued to pursue postgraduate studies for his MSc and MPhil degree at the same university. So he obtained his MSc and MPhil degrees in the year 2016 and 2018 respectively. Currently, he is pursuing PhD at National University of Malaysia under a well-known and uh, affectionate professor, Dr. Muhammad Amri bin Muhammad. His postgraduate research is focused on uh, silicon-based semiconductor, thin film deposition and applications. He is currently working on heavy iron doped zinc oxide-based ID materials and their applications in non-volatile memory devices. He has published three ISI high impact journals in this in his first year of PhD and has uh, three conferences or paper presentations. Besides that, he has achieved few other awards at national and international level, including first prize in Micrograph Award oral presentation at International Conference on Solid State Science and Technology, IECSST 2019 and the National Bronze Medal in Nano Olympiad Malaysia 2019. Currently, besides research, he is also actively involved in co-curricular activities. He is also the president of graduate ambassadors at National University of Malaysia. So very long introduction of Brother Jamal Kazmi. So please start. Uh, thank you very much for your kind invitation. Uh, I'll be sharing my slides. Uh, you have already introduced me. Uh, I'm really feeling pleasure to be among all the doctors and like maybe feeling a little bit of infinity complex <laughs> among all doctors because I'm just a PhD student uh, and learning from all you seniors. So I'll be sharing my screen uh, to give my talk without further ado. Mm. Please uh, let me know if you can see my slides. We can now, now it is okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. 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 Uh, Bismillah ar uh, I'll be giving my talk on the Bismuth uh, improved, uh, Bismuth doping improved the negative properties of zinc oxide in wires. Uh, as mentioned in my research, uh, in my bibliography, my main focus is to explore the bind dimension nanomaterials, uh, particularly zinc oxide and zinc oxide nanowires. So uh, I'm using uh, basically zinc oxide to uh, for the non-volatile memory devices, which is really uh, like not really frequently used uh, these days. I just got a project, uh, like I just wrote a project for my supervisor and it got accepted. Uh, that's quite uh, good for me that we can explore something new from zinc oxide, particularly for memory devices, which is not really used uh, nowadays. So my basic concept is to, to uh, dope zinc oxide with different uh, materials, some zinc metals, and particularly here, I'm using heavy iron doped uh, materials. Uh, here, I'm using bismuth uh, for my studies. So which is uh, just a very new study. Like I recently published this RSC advances uh, in, in this year, in June. So uh, my option, yeah. I just published this in RSC advances, and this is uh, uh, mainly first support uh, using bismuth of uh, bismuth of zinc oxide uh, to improve the magnetic properties of the zinc oxide so that we can use it for the uh, memory device applications you know that uh, zinc oxide has been used uh, uh, since many years like many decades in the different applications uh, as shown in on my slide but uh, particularly using for the non-volatile memory devices uh, using the doping concept is uh, just a uh, not really new, but using the heavy iron top uh, materials is just a new thing. So this is an overview of how uh, we started to develop the memory devices from, uh, you know, the 15 feet tall IBM computers having just five uh, MB memory. And then we kept shifting on the magnetic drum storage and magnetic tapes. And later on, we shifted to uh, hard disk, copy, CD, and flash drives. But now, uh, in the current era, we are working on the non-volatile memory devices. Uh, you can see here uh, where we have just a device uh, in the dimensions of a uh, few nanometers. So like uh, there are reports that uh, devices have been fabricated in the scale of two nanometers. And uh, one of our senior CK members, Dr. Yabarabas, uh, he published his uh, paper in 
a general where they reported uh, just a five nanometer uh, scale device. So this is really remarkable and uh, appreciable. Uh, and uh, this kind of uh, stuff nowadays is a really hot uh, field of interest, uh, particularly in my field. So this is the outline of my talk today. I'm using uh, nanomaterials and what is the classification and then why we are using nanomaterials. In particular, in single side, why I'm using two six uh, class of semiconductors and uh, why I'm using the particularly this method and then experimental technique I used in the results and discussion. So uh, I will not waste my time a lot on the induction part of the nanomaterials. I expect that all of the senior members, uh, they know well what are the nanomaterials and how small they are and what are the one-dimensional, two-dimensional, three-dimensional and zero-dimensional materials. So this is just an overview. Uh, and then uh, why we use the nanomaterials because when we go from top to bottom, uh, the, one of the principal factors that uh, it enhances its reactivity, strength and electrical properties. So it is really uh, important to know that when we do the top to bottom approach, uh, the, 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 the the area surface to a volume ratio uh, it really increases and that tends to increase the reactivity, uh, strength and electrical and magnetic properties of the material. So I'm using 2-6 uh, class of uh, semiconductor materials because they have a wide spectrum of energy gap and then compared to the 3-5 semiconductors to 2-6 semiconductors have strong polarity uh, is more ionic and less covalent correction. So and then the magnetic ions can easily be can, are incorporated into the Think of size uh, compared to the other classes of materials. I'm using, as I previously told, that I'm using heavy iron uh, dope material. Particularly here, I'm using bismuth. So bismuth is a heavy iron non-magnetic element, uh, and doping with transition metals like transition metals like cobalt, nickel, and others. If we dope with those kind of materials, that creates the doubt in the origin of ferromagnetism and think of size because transition metal is itself are magnetic. So if we want to explore the uh, zinc properties of zinc oxide, like you know, zinc oxide is a, a magnetic material in a, a ferromagnetic, but that ferromagnetism is not really stable. So, if we want to explore the magnetic properties, we use the doping concept. But, but if we use the transition metals, uh, transition metal they are itself uh, magnetic, so it creates a doubt in the region of ferromagnetic. That's why we are using the concept of non magnetic, non magnetic heavy ion element. So, bismuth doping presents the advantage of stabilizing ferromagnetic response due to spin orbit energy associated with its spin ion code. Yeah. So, uh, BI doping leads to increase in the magnetic energy and ultimately uh, the magnetization. So, uh, if we use a bismuth, bismuth is not really magnetic. So, if we uh, can st stabilize the uh, magnetism in zinc oxide, means that it is purely from bismuth. So, bismuth itself is non magnetic. By doping a non-magnetic element into zinc oxide, if we can get the stabilized magnetic properties, so that is really very good uh, for that. Many applications besides uh, uh, for besides the application in the non-volatile medium device. I'm using uh, a hydrothermal method. You may know about the CVD, MOCVD, and PLD that are really high temperature and high vacuum levels are required for the fabrication of the any any kind of uh, material besides zinc oxide, zinc films, or whatever you want to fabricate. They require a sophisticated setup and uh, many other complexities are there. So I am simply using the solution process. I don't really require a vacuum, a high vacuum. I can fabricate my device or my uh, my zinc oxide uh, at uh, pre vacuum level. Besides, I'm using a low temperature below 100 degrees Celsius. Uh, there are reports on uh, using hydrothermal method just for 65 degrees Celsius while uh, using CVD. In PLD things, we normally use 900 to 1000 degrees Celsius. And of course, this is a low cost method and uh, high quality of nanowires with high yield can use it. If you are using the uh, let's go CVD, you have to have a very small uh, dimension of your substrate, maybe a few millimeters. But here, uh, I can uh, grow a lot of zinc oxide, like I can obtain the high yield with a very big substrate and then. I can break the substrate into different pieces uh, for the different characterizations or to make a different device. So the chemicals we are using here are really uh, friendly chemicals, environment, environment friendly chemicals, and they are not really uh, harmful uh, to the environment. We can openly use the risk. So this is uh, just an overview of how I prepare my zinc oxide nanowires and how I dope my zinc oxide uh, with bismuth material. 
bisphenyl nitrate. So this is the final uh, substrate. Uh, when I spin coat the zinc oxide nanoparticles and later using the same process to grow the zinc oxide nanowires. So this is the efficient image that is uh, obtained after I prepare zinc oxide nanoparticles on this particular substrate. This is a silicon substrate. So uh, a very short uh, physics behind the mechanism of uh, nanowires morphology. So uh, normally uh, the zinc oxide nanoparticles, uh, when we spin coat them on the substrate, they provide a seeding zone uh, for the zinc oxide nanowires to grow vertically along the C-axis. Because uh, zinc oxide has a polar facet, the top of the surface is negative, while the side walls are positive. So we are using two precursors, HMTA and zinc nitrate. So HMTA generates the negative ions accumulating on the side walls. So HMTA, which is negative, it will be accumulating on the side walls of the zinc oxide and the alignment is vertical because negative ions accumulate on the surface that forbid the side wall goes along the C axis. Conversely, an agent with positive, because we are growing the zinc oxide nano wires, but if we want to grow the zinc oxide nano sheets, what we have to do is, uh, Conversely, an agent with the positive ions will ensure the sidewall growth, resulting in the nano sheets like nano belts, nano plates, etc. So this is the basic uh, phenomenon that happens behind the ball. These are the FECM results from my uh, zinc oxide uh, nano wires doped with bismuth. So uh, you can see from the figure A, this is a pure zinc oxide nano wire where there is no doping. So you can see a very good hexagonal shape as I explained earlier. Zinc oxide and nanowires are hexagonal. Uh, they are hexagonal. They have a hexagonal structure, and uh, we can see that they are perfectly hexagonal. And uh, they, 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 the, the average diameter of the nanowire is below 100 nanometers. That is around 86 nanometers. So when I dope the bismuth, so I dope the bismuth at the different concentration. 1%, 3%, and 5%. So what are the thing is, uh, we see that there is a possible uh, there's a change in the diameter as we dope the bismuth. And the possible explanation for the increase in diameter and the change in the surface morphology can be correlated to the accumulation of the OH negative ions on the side walls of the nanowires, which hinders the growth of the side walls only along the exit group. OK, with the doping of bismuth, Bismuth nitrate acting as a weak base reduces the number of OH ions released by HMTA. The reduction in OH negative ions yielded an increase in the radial growth, and thereby the diameter of zinc oxide nanowires increased. You can see the increase in that. Here you can see the arrow diameter is uh, increased. In contrast, after a certain doping level, so if you see until 1 and 3%, until 3%, the bismuth. Uh, after doping with bismuth, uh, the average diameter of zinc oxide nanowires is increased significantly compared to the pristine zinc oxide. But in contrast, after a separate, uh, certain doping level, bismuth begins to produce the bismuth oxide phase in the system due to the excessive content of bismuth. The doping resulted in a slight increase in the diameter of the nanowires, which can be related to the bismuth oxide phase. So if we exceed the bismuth doping after a threshold. So we will observe that there is a uh, there is the appearance of oxide phase. And if you see the surface compared to the side walls, if you can see this inside figures, if you see the figure A, you, see, you can see the tip and the side walls, they are really smooth. But on increasing the bismuth concentration, the tip of the nanowires are porous compared to the side walls. So this is due to the uh, difference in the surface energy. The surface energy at the tips is higher compared to the side walls. So Bismuth will most probably like to be uh, incorporated in the tip compared to the side wall. So we can see there is there are porous uh, change in the surface, uh, which uh, which could be uh, really uh, explored further for another interesting uh, kind of application. So this is uh, the EDX uh, images we show here. These EDX show the presence of zinc and oxygen elements in the pristine zinc oxide sample. When the pristine zinc oxide was doped with bismuth atom, the appearance of the bismuth peak can be observed. So you can see the bismuth peaks here, okay, which can be seen in B and C. Yeah. 
it is remarkable that figure b and c the bi peak intensity increases with the piston concentration increase from 1% to 3% respectively indicating the incorporation of piston ions into the zinc oxide crystal structure where figure d presents the elemental mapping of the piston 3% dope zinc oxide in wise figure uh, d this uh, figure d 1 2 3 4 i will call them 1 2 3 4 uh, show the elemental mapping containing the information of all possible elements present in piston dope 3% zinc oxide in wise uh, the relatively higher brightness on the piston contained on the tip surface shows that most of the piston diffuses into the tip of the new wire can be seen in the figure 2 and 3 yeah if you can uh, you can see in the figure 2 you will see this is the more brighter area compared to the sides compared to the sides so it means that most of the piston is incorporated in the tip of the surface which can be seen here that there is a porous surface that also embalms the film of piston more, more on the on the surface compared to the side walls Besides the O element in the figure 4, the red, relatively higher brightness on the tip surface also indicates the possibility of formation of bismuth oxide phase. So, you know, uh, bismuth oxide, it contains the excess of oxygen. So here, we also assume that when we increase the number of doping for the case of bismuth, so it is probable that the bismuth oxide phase is also appear in the bismuth oxide uh, Form on the surface of the nanowire, so uh, which also later hinders the more uh, increase in the diameter of the uh, nanowire. So this is the uh, uh, translation electron microscopy analysis of uh, our sample. It obtained uh, images uh, in the figure. We demonstrate the prepared zinc form for high high uh, high quality crystalline zinc oxide uh, nanowire and their structure uh, with a smooth surface are followed to the 001 growth, uh, growth direction. The internal spacing which grew along the 001 direction was calculated to be 0 0.026 mm. This is a good agreement with the previous report. Like we know that for the zinc oxide, the internal layer spacing is 0 0.26 mm, which is confirmed here for our case also. So, to examine the effect of doping on the different spots of the prepared zinc oxide, we use the bismuth uh, dope 3% sample uh, of the single nanowire. So, we choose two spots the tip and the stem, which are marked as D and E in the figure C, respectively. The HR10 images of these spots reveal that bismuth dope zinc oxide crystal structure tend to become fully crystalline in nature, as we can observe in this figure C. In A and E. The observation may be due to the incorporation of the bismuth into the zinc oxide lattice. However, there are no segregated clusters of the impurity phase appearing throughout the nanowire. So, even though uh, we assume that there are some oxide phases uh, in, the, in the system, but still there is no uh, segregation of the cluster. So, it means that. Uh, we, we still get a single crystal uh, zinc oxide structure uh, and then for the case of this uh, D and E we have calculated the internal spacing which is uh, increased uh, compared to the pristine one so on the tip it was just 0 0.26 nanometer while when we dope the business at the tip and the stem you can see that the uh, internal spacing is also changed significantly to 0 0.284 nanometer and to 0 0.26 nanometer. So this is, these are the XRD results obtained. So uh, you can see the, uh, from the pure zinc oxide in wires, this is a 002 plane, which is grown along the uh, 001 direction, uh, which is C axis. And you know uh, that uh, this is the preferred uh, oriental direction. Uh, C axis is preferred due to the crystal in isotropic nature because uh, the hydrothermal complexes react to form the hydro hexagonal crystal structure of zinc oxide. The high intensity of 002 peak provides information on the dominant reflection from the top hexagonal phase of the nanowires, which predominantly grow particularly along the C axis with the hexagonal vortex surface. So this obtained pattern are in good agreement uh, with the presence of the hexagonal uh, vortex phase structure of zinc oxide, that is this card number. Uh, 
uh, shows that it uh, belongs to the hexagonal Buddha phase. Okay, it is remarkable uh, that the intensity of zinc oxide nanowire in, is increased when the basement doping concentration is increased from 1% to 3%. So you can see this 0, 0, 0 peak. This is pure one. When we dope the uh, basement at 1% and 3%, you can see the intensity of zinc oxide nanowire is increased. And the relatively narrow and the high intensity peak. Uh, of the basement 3% as compared to the pristine and 1% sample indicates that the basement dope increases the crystallinity of the zinc oxide nanowire. While upon doping on the 5%, the, there is a decrease in the intensity, implies the cylinder loss of crystallinity caused by the distortion of the lens. So, uh, BI doping into the uh, periodic lattice of the zinc oxide tends to produce a small amount of the strain as can seen in the figure 3C uh, and uh, consequently lead to the crystal uh, regularity modification. So if we see uh, this 002 peak enlarged here, we can see that there, are there is a stress strain produced in the sample, which also confirms the incorporation of the zinc oxide uh, bismuth into the zinc oxide crystal lattice. So uh, later, this is the uh, uh, studies on the uh, uv based spectroscopic analysis of the undoped in the basement doped zinc oxide in uh, We can see there is a change in the band gap. So there is a, a red shape observed when the basement doping creates the allowed and is energy states with the band gap intends to reduce the optical band gap of zinc oxide in The reduction in the optical band gap of the basement dope samples at 3, 1, 3, and 5 percent may be attributed to the SPD exchange interaction between the localized D electrons in the band electrons of the BI ions during the incorporation of bismuth ions into the zinc oxide lattice. So uh, we can modify the band gap by doping the zinc bismuth into the zinc oxide lattice. So this is, could be uh, one of the another study to explore the optical properties of the zinc oxide. So this is the PL shown here. This is the PL spectra. So uh, this shows the enlarged UV emission behavior in the range of 381 to 393 uh, region. In the fitted spectra from B, C, D, and E, two obvious regions, PL regions can be observed for the pure in the bismuth dope samples. The first region, corresponds to the UV emission band in the range of 381 to uh, 780 nanometers in the visible spectrum region. The UV emission peak is ascribed to the ex excitonic emission from the near band edge uh, transition of the wide band gap of the zinc oxide during the recombination of the free excitonic throughout uh, an exciton exciton process. The other broad visible region is from 450 uh, to 780 nanometers uh, that is attributed to the tun uh, tunneling of the surface bound electrons uh, through pre uh, existing trapped holes formed by the surface anion vacancies, oxygen vacancies, and or oxygen related interface or uh, surface states. So the signature of the excitonic band was observed at 381, uh, observed at 381 here at 381 nanometer for the pure. However, upon doping at the different concentrations, 1%, uh, 3%, and 5%, this peak red shifted to the 382, 384.6, and 393 nanometers respectively. So uh, we have seen that the, uh, the defects related peaks are seen to be observed uh, while we dope the bismuth at a different concentration in zinc oxide in wild. So this is really remarkable in terms of the optical properties uh, and also in terms of the magnetic properties so that we can uh, see what are the effects of the bismuth doping on the on the defect zones of the uh, zinc oxide nanowires when we observe from the PL uh, spectra. So these are the X, XPS analysis of the bismuth doped zinc oxide nanowires. I'll be discussing this area first. So uh, in figure A, a strong spin orbit coupling uh, can be observed. Uh, the zinc 2p signal uh, splits into two symmetrical peaks at the binding energies of 
1021 and 1044 with the spin orbit split, uh, splitting of 30, uh, 23 electron volt. The symmetrical peak can be uh, assigned to the zinc uh, 2 plus 2p3 by 2 uh, and zinc uh, 2 plus 2p1 by 2 respectively corresponding to Zn2 plus bound to the oxygen and to the zinc oxide matrix. Meanwhile, uh, uh, this B shows that the binding energy of the zinc 2p uh, peak increased from 1021.93 and 1044.93 respectively for bismuth dope one percent concentration in the zinc oxide nanowise uh, by increasing the bismuth uh, doping concentration up to three percent the zn2 peak binding energies decreased from 1021.65 and 1044.65 respectively so from here you can see if we try to draw a straight line so you can see the the peak is shifted towards the left to the different binding energies and can be seen in the figure C here from bigger figure B and C. Uh, OK, if we go uh, to the oxygen peaks, the OS1 peaks of the pristine zinc oxide and wires in figure D, it shows the asymmetric profile and can be fitted into the two symmetrical uh, peaks at the 530.43 and 531.69 electron volt, indicating the presence of two different types of the oxide little species in the sample uh, the oxygen peaks at 530.43 electron volt is the lowest binding energy uh, o2 ion uh, the lowest binding energy ol2 in the os uh, on one spectrum which can be attributed to the o2 ions in the hexagonal structure of zinc oxide lattice surrounded by the uh, zinc atoms in contrast, the peak at the 531.69 electron volt is the intermediate binding energy peak, uh, which may be associated with the O2 ions in the oxygen uh, deficient regions uh, uh, within the matrix of zinc oxide. Here, uh, when we dope the zinc oxide at 1% with bismuth doping, uh, two new peaks, two new peaks uh, here, one here and one here. Uh, are observed in the presence of in the profile of the OS1. A very small peak at this uh, 528 electron volt could be correlated to the bismuth oxide peak, which will be later proved here, uh, here, and here. So, this peak. Another significant peak known as the higher binding energy peak, that is the OOH, appeared at 532.5 electron volt, which corresponds to the absorbed hydroxyl group on the surface preferable at the oxygen vacancy sites uh, of the nanowires. A similar trend was uh, observed in the figure F. Interestingly, when the bismuth doping concentration was increased at the 5%, the intensity of the uh, peak at 529.06 was increased. So you can see there was no peak of the, uh, this uh, absorbed hydroxyl group. But when we doped the 1% and 3%, so this intensity keeps on increasing. On parallel, if we just uh, observe the bismuth peaks, the bismuth metal peaks and bismuth uh, oxide peaks, so this is the uh, case for the 1%. You see these uh, metal peaks uh, are clearly observed here, while uh, when we dope at the 3%, you see the bismuth metal peaks are not dominant, rather the bismuth oxide peaks are dominant. Also, in case of the 5% and 10% uh, bismuth, so these peaks are not really dominant. So this means that on increasing the bismuth concentration, so the bismuth metal peaks uh, are suppressed and the bismuth oxide phases starts to appear, which is not really good for our magnetic properties, which we'll, we will discuss later in the magnetic property section. So we propose that bismuth 1% is the threshold doping for the zinc oxide so that we can clearly see the bismuth metal peak here, which will uh, contribute to the magnetic properties. While we if we have the uh, higher uh, oxide peaks, uh, they can hinder the magnetic properties, which are not desired in our case. Uh, lastly, uh, these are the magnetic properties. We are using the squared measurements for this. So you can see this uh, is a pure zinc oxide. Uh, we measure at uh, low temperature, 4 Kelvin, and at room temperature, uh, that is the black one. And then we use the bismuth 1% doping in zinc oxide. And we measure, and we can see that uh, the bismuth, uh, when we do uh, at the bismuth, so a BI 
uh, improves the magnetic saturation of the sample at low temperature and is uh, significantly reduced. While for the 3%, we can see the sample showed the poor magnetic response due to the appearance of the bi 2 3 oxide, bismuth oxide phase in the crystal, which we confirmed from the XPS just now, means that uh, when we increase the bismuth concentration, that is not really good for the uh, for the magnetic applications, maybe uh, for other applications, but not particularly for here, uh, it can hinder the magnetic properties. So, uh, but here, no magnetic phase transition in the temperature range. So we have this uh, MP curve, which is very important to understand the the the, the uh, how how the properties change when we use the temperature. We come from zero from very low temperature to high temperature. Uh, we want to see the change. So there is you can see from these uh, plots. This is for pure one percent and three percent. There is uh, no phase transition in the in the temperature range from 20 Kelvin to the 300 Kelvin. There is a small this uh, change while we start from the low temperature, but until 20 percent, and after onwards, uh, we don't see any uh, phase transition in the temperature range from 20 Kelvin to 300 Kelvin. Even though in the pristine sample the magnetization seems to uh, decrease near 250 Kelvin, uh, but in the case of one percent, uh, but in the case of one percent and three percent dope samples. It remains essentially constant uh, in the whole temperature range. All the samples remain ferromagnetic until room temperature and even at high temperature. So these can be very uh, useful in the for the next generation room temperature operation in the thin uh, tonic based uh, switching devices. So this is really uh, appealing. These are results are really appealing and interesting to explore the further magnetic properties of the bismuth dope. And heavy ion dope zinc oxide in wires, but these are just uh, few results. Uh, just few results, not all the results from my paper. Uh, I have a lot of data as a supplementary data, and besides that, I have many other uh, results which I presented in the papers, but not in the slides. But the ultimate goal is to move further to apply this kind of application in the memory devices. So I just want to uh, give an overview. So I, I'm uh, trying to prepare uh, some of the see-through devices. This is, these are the, uh, I'm using the FPO substrates to uh, use the same process uh, to uh, grow the zinc oxide nanowires, bismuth doped zinc oxide nanowires on the FPO, and then to check the magnetic properties uh, of, the, uh, of these particular devices. The, just these are some devices I want to show. And then uh, some of the devices I prepare on the silicon substrate so these are the top electrodes. I'm totally using the very simple and solution process methods until the deposition of top electrode. So this is the top electrode of the aging nanowires. I'm using the simple uh, spray coating technique to deposit the aging nanowires on the top electrode. Then we measure the uh, from the SMU setup. We can measure the magnetic properties. So these are uh, this is the particularly uh, is uh, just one of the schematic uh, overview of my device. So this is my glass substrate. Uh, coated by FTO, then I am using uh, in, a, in a polymer uh, layer of the PMSSQ, then the zinc oxide particles, then the zinc oxide in wires, and then again the polymer layer, and then the top electrode. So these are my own results. Uh, you can see uh, that uh, these all layers, uh, they don't really exceed, uh, like they are below uh, 500 nanometers. So my device is like I can, uh, you can see that this is kind of see through device. Uh, that I can uh, prepare uh, all the layers below 500 nanometers. So, though, though this is not really uh, appealing, like I, as I mentioned in my slides in the previous, uh, in the very start, that people have been reporting like below 100 nanometer, below 50 nanometer, below 10 nanometer. But this is a like solution process, and this is really difficult to control the uh, the spin coating that we can ach achieve like 100 nanometers. And below is crucial, but I'm still working on that, and that will be my future uh, work, inshallah. And these are some of the magnetic property results. Uh, uh, so these are some of the IV curves for the magnetic uh, 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 results. These are very prim primary results, and I'm not going to discuss these at the moment. But I'll be inshallah working on this for my next paper, and uh, I'll be exploring more on this. And this, uh, these are uh, like I don't want to conclude the. Uh, uh, future outcomes because I already uh, spoke a lot 
I don't want to uh, take more time, and I want to open the floor for the questions. And thank you very much uh, for beating this all for long. That's all. So may I start with the questions? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Uh, I'm waiting for my slides to finish. Yeah, 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 I'm back now. If you can go back to your slide for the UV absorption, UV spectroscopy. Okay. Uh, we can't yeah. see your slides. <laughs> Have no, you stopped? I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. Uh. Yeah. Uh. Uh. I mean, we can see an absorption edge around, uh, let's say, 360 mm -hmm. in this blue and red uh, uh, curves. That yeah. is for pristine zinc and low concentration zinc. But for higher amount of bismuth, we don't see the edge at the longer wavelengths. And uh, I guess they they were red shifted or not? Yeah, they they were red shifted as I mentioned that they were red red shifted because of the SPD exchange interaction. But uh, particularly, if I mention here for five percent, uh, this is really uh, something like I shouldn't <laughs> present there. This these are my raw results actually. I I, I replaced this five percent later because uh, when I measured these results for the very first time, uh, we didn't get anything on the glass substrate when we doped the bismuth for five percent. But uh, of course, we have the absorption uh, for this concentration as well. But the, this one is, yeah, you, you can and, ignore. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know, but uh, what I see is an absorption band, a broad absorption band at 360. Mm -hmm. uh, for the red shift, we should expect uh, this absorption band uh, to somewhat like towards longer wavelengths. Yeah, 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 yeah. So if I like, uh, maybe this is a large scale, but if I particularly focus on this area, so mm -hmm. this, it is uh, like uh, noticeable that the, the peaks are shifted to the longer wavelength. Yeah, the peaks here, they are shifted to the longer wavelength, but they are not really like, uh, not really that uh, big difference you can observe from here, but on like focusing particularly on this area, we will observe that the peaks are shifted. If you see the, the black peak is here, but the blue yeah. one is here and the red one is here. So uh, there is a difference in the, mm. like it is red, red shifted, but maybe we cannot really observe from an eye. Because of the scale. Yeah, okay. because of the scale, exactly, exactly. Okay, and if you go to the photoluminescence, that's it, that's emission. The next slide, I guess. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, here it is, I think, we're more, um, prominent that you can see the red shift, uh, yep, at least yeah, in the emission. Yeah. So now, yeah, now here, what I do is I just, uh, I just zoom this scale, this scale, very ignore. If you like, if you see the spectrum here, you can't really see the, this peak really. But if we focus here now, we can observe the red shifting clearly. Uh, we, you can see that the peaks are shifting towards the right. Uh, and I did this may be a stupid question, but uh, these, uh, have you done the frank content analysis of this? Because uh, under a broad peak, we see some smaller peaks. That's from the... Uh, uh, the which frank. analysis? Can you please repeat? Uh, this so-called so effect called frank frank Cordon effect. Normally oh, yeah. we see. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, so these, uh, uh, I don't understand the, the, there's a broader peak and there is a, there are smaller peaks. What do these smaller peaks mean? Uh, I oh, missed yeah. that point. Uh, yeah, sure, sure. So actually, uh, these peaks I done myself. I like I did the fitting, the peak fitting, because when we submitted our manuscript, the reviewer asked us to ask us to do the fitting so that we can see what are the actual peaks available uh, in this whole spectrum range. Yeah. So these are actually uh, the fitted peaks. So uh, like based on this, we can uh, comment on the defect related peaks and other possible peaks in the different re regimes like the UV region and the near band edge region, you know, this all uh, we can discuss on that. So these are the done by my own self okay. just for the deep, you know, to, to uh, actually show how how like uh, prominent peaks are available in under this all uh, spectrum. And which model did you use for this fitting? 
uh, i did this uh, by simple origin fitting um, okay but i mean which uh, which model do you, do you use because uh, you think the, these fix are coming from uh, different like band edge emission or normally mm. i used to do this i'm or i'm trying to use, do this for different processes uh, for organic emitters oh. so that's why i'm a little bit interested in that uh i'm not sure about your question because i mean uh, if you you know if you do the uh, origin fitting that straight forward like you use the uh, what we call the uh, what we call the gaussian fitting like that gaussian curve fitting or shirley fitting these are different there are different options in the origin uh okay but i mean um, uh, from that fitting how, can you tell that this is from band emission this is uh, or frank or uh, not really not really not really okay so we need to have the deep studies on the uh, i i still uh, like doubt on the my fitting uh, uh, what we call the expertise but i mean this is still acceptable to discuss the discuss the you know we want to we are particularly interested in the uh, the defects uh, appeared after the doping diff increment in the defects or the reduction in the defects in the zinc oxide lattice so we we were just uh, particularly referring to that uh, at the moment for this case but uh, for that all uh, you are referring to maybe uh, i don't have expertise on that or maybe uh, uh, I, should, okay. I should yeah okay just uh, if you can zoom it a little bit yeah sure sure please so uh, i maybe i missed that but uh the uh, both of these uh, graphs are uh, the one with the different uh, doping percentages uh, the a and yeah. b they are both uh, emission spectras yes mm -hmm. both are emission spectra mm -hmm. but uh, i mean how did you uh, measure the broader peak from the pristine uh, zinc oxide because i see the maxima at uh, uh, invisible range so uh, i don't know 550 but on the a graph uh, we see the emission maxima at uh, uv range i would say uh, yeah i mean or near uh, visible range so actually i i did the fitting for this all so this is like this peak around in the uv range is really small like really small not really dominant compared to this all because of the y scale intensity scale so the the y scale is really large compared to that's why i did not mention the y scale because uh, if i mention ah, maybe okay okay i yeah, know yeah. i get it yeah yeah so i what i did is i particularly zoomed in this and reduced the scale to make it dominant yeah okay okay now i get yeah. it oh, so yeah. maybe maybe what you can do is use the same color so that we cannot got oh, okay. yeah, um, yeah. confused i i get it so you have this is I, the onset uh, uh, onset of the graph here yeah. yes Just yep you you onset okay okay exactly 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 okay sorry so thank you very much uh brother jamal thank you so much for a nice talk thank you sir thank you much for uh, giving this precious yeah it was a, it was a wonderful talk and with this